Thank you all for coming tonight. And I'm uh, curious just how many of you are residents of the city of Los Angeles and have a chance to vote on S? Okay, overwhelming numbers and everybody I'm assuming here lives in the county of Los Angeles. If you don't live in Los Angeles County and you're here, you really are a political junkie. <laughs> <laughs> Drove up from Orange County to hear Angelinos debate this. Uh, so we're gonna get into this shortly. One thing I wanna mention is it's great for the audience when we air this tomorrow on the radio at 10.30 uh, to hear applause when we go into and we go out of the segments just to give a sense of, of live. It tells the radio listeners, yeah, there's an audience here. Uh, the energy of the audience is there. So if you're okay with that, if you're comfortable applauding, uh, I'll give you a little cue as we go in and out of the break. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, let's uh, bring up our first two uh, folks to converse with us about Measure S for the City of Los Angeles. Uh, Jill Stewart, Campaign Director of Yes on S. Come right up here. <laughs> and also with us from uh, the uh, coalition that opposes Measure S, Laura Raymond, Campaign Director of the Alliance for Community Transit. So she'll right, sit right next to Jill here. And uh, what we're gonna do, as John mentioned, we'll take uh, some screened audience questions after we do the first two segments uh, of our um, back and forth here on Measure S. So whenever you are ready to go, Tony, we can get started with the broadcast portion of it. From the Crawford Family Forum at KPCC, this is the Air Talk in person voter game plan. <laughs> Great to have you with us. I'm Larry Mantle. For the next 90 minutes, we'll take on two important ballot measures in the city and county of Los Angeles. First up, LA City's Measure S, a two year moratorium on larger scale developments. Next hour, LA County's Measure H, a quarter cent sales tax increase to provide homeless services. LA voters will decide both next Tuesday, March 7th. Well, let's get right into Measure S. Beyond the two year moratorium on bigger and denser projects, it requires updating the city's general plan and the city's many neighborhood plans. It also requires city staff do the environmental impact reports instead of developers or the companies they hire. With us to debate Measure S, the former managing editor of the LA Weekly, now director of Yes on S, Jill Stewart, and the opponent from the coalition, <laughs> urging no on S, and the Alliance for Community Transit, Laura Raymond. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, let me begin, uh, Jill Stewart, with you. What is the problem that Measure S is designed to solve? You know, I think that we know that LA is going to become a much more dense city. Uh, our group is very much involved in believing that and in trying to facilitate that by having some rules, some ground rules for how that happens. Right now, Los Angeles, is essentially being planned, I, I wanna say higgly-piggly, I know that's not a scientific phrase, uh, but what's happened is because the plans for LA are so very, very old, uh, it gives developers, especially really wealthy developers, billionaires who are fighting Measure S, as a matter of fact, it gives them a lot of leeway to come into the city and say, your plans are really old, you need density, you need tall buildings, I wanna, I wanna put one right here where I bought some land. And what's happened is you have speculation going on because the city is up for grabs. There isn't a current plan. Uh, we believe at S that the city has to do a current plan. It's called a general plan. It's very wonky, but the basic idea is you wouldn't take a ship across rough waters without a compass and a map and radar, and Los Angeles is doing that right now. We need the compass, the map, and the radar. And it has to be done through a transparent process. We believe that democracy is about people involved and people right there in their communities hashing it out, fighting it out, talking it out, laughing it out, but in fact, dealing with their representatives and having a say. And this is a crucial time in Los Angeles because the longest I was a journalist, and it was for many years, starting out at the LA Times in the 80s when I was just a young girl, LA had incredible growth. The population boom was unbelievable. There was no time to stop and think. 
Now we have slow growth in Los Angeles, 1.1% a year, which I've never seen. It maybe happened at some point in my long career as a journalist. I don't remember it. So there's a chance right now to say, okay, okay there's no plan. Let's make a plan. Laura Raymond, what do you think would happen if Measure S passes? How would you see it affecting development? Yeah, so there's a lot of confusion out there about what Measure S is and what it is not. Measure S is a ban on zoning changes for two years. It's a permanent ban on general plan amendments for, for parcels that are less than 15 acres. Right now, Los Angeles is in a housing crisis. We are the most unaffordable city in the entire country when you factor in both high rents and the poverty wages that a lot of jobs right now in the city are providing. Um, and so we have some of the worst overcrowding in in the entire country. Actually, the three most overcrowded zip codes in LA are South Central LA, Pico Union, and Huntington Park. Uh, we also have 28,000 people living on the streets. We, need, we desperately need affordable housing and homeless housing. We're right now at a moment in LA where we just passed Proposition HHH in the fall, which is $1.2 billion that we finally have to build homeless housing. And um, Measure S would actually block a lot of that homeless housing from being built because it would the, the parcels of land would need general plan amendments to move forward. We just passed Proposition JJJ overwhelmingly. 64% of voters approved that in the fall. This would create thousands of new affordable units, but those would be blocked by Measure S. So as an affordable housing coalition, which is the coalition I'm, work, I'm with, uh, we're very concerned by this measure and we're, voting, we're urging voters who care about equitable development in the city and sustainable development in the city to vote no. So Jill, your response to that, that this would uh, essentially stop development for two years and put a huge crimp in the plans to create more affordable housing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, there are a lot of misconceptions, but and with all due respect uh, to Laura, I know you do great work. Um, however, the city is fighting tooth and nail to not change. And what we have is a status quo establishment who are putting out a lot of bad information. And I know dealing with this over the, my time as a journalist, it's easy to get caught up in what we do today call fake news. It used to be called something else. Um, we do not, in fact, stop most uh, homeless housing. Uh, the city did put together a pilot project and they picked 10 pieces of land and they were going to see if they could build homeless housing on it to show the public how they would go about using the HHH money. And this started about a year ago, putting together the land. And somehow they came up with 10 pieces of land called public facilities land that no one can ever build housing on. It's not allowed by the city charter. I don't want to say that the city trumped up 10 pieces of land that can't be built on, but we do know that the city has 250 pieces of underutilized land that could be built into homeless housing immediately under our measure. So we do an exem exemption during this very limited, very short moratorium. We have an exemption for 100% affordable housing. The, the, the H money, which we, by the way, we, we really were so behind HHH, very, very important. It's got to be done. It's way overdue. Our measure will actually speed up the construction of um, HHH homeless housing. The but city- what, what about inclusive housing, though, where you've got projects that have units that are set aside, those wouldn't be able to be built? Yeah, actually, you're talking about what most people call it density bonus, where you get an extra floor on top of the building you're allowed to build, and that is used to put in about 10% affordable housing. That's how LA builds most of its affordable housing. It's extremely rare in Los Angeles to seek a zone change for density bonus. Almost all density bonus is done what's called by right. You're allowed to do it. It's already zoned for that. We're not touching things that are already zoned. We, we, we believe and honor the developers who are following the rules. So I, I want to say that you're, you have a big misconception if you think we're going to have any serious effect. There might be one or two projects that are asking for a major zone change. It's very, very, okay. very rare. So Laura, do you have specific projects that you think would be stopped under S? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of projects that would be stopped under S. Our members, we're at the Alliance for Community Transit, we're 32 organizations. Some of our members build affordable housing. Little Tokyo Service Center in Little Tokyo, uh, they're planning to build a 74 unit project for homeless veterans. Uh, ha and, and then some of the units in there will be for low-income families, they'll not be able to build that if Measure S moves forward. 
Um, another one of our members, Trust South LA, is planning to build a 120 unit, 100% affordable project in South LA with a health clinic in there, with a park. They will not be able to build that if Measure S moves forward. Um, also, the, the, what Jill said about the, the homeless sites, that's not true. These homeless, these homeless projects funded by HHH will not move forward. And that's why every single affordable housing and homeless ha housing provider in Los Angeles opposes Measure S. The housing movement is united against Measure S. You've got groups like the ACLU that call this a regressive okay. and deceptive measure. We're going to continue our conversation. Uh, joining us, Laura Raymond from the Alliance for Community Transit. They're part of the coalition against Measure S. Jill Stewart, uh, who is in favor of uh, Measure S, uh, director of the Yes campaign, joining us as well. A little bit later on today, we're going to talk about Measure H, Los Angeles County's quarter cent sales tax increase to fund homeless services. But much more to come on S. We'll be back right after this live update. From the Crawford Family Forum at KPCC, this is the AirTalk in-person voter game plan. <laughs> Great to have you with us. I'm Larry Mantle. We're talking in this 90-minute special portion of AirTalk about Los Angeles City's Measure S, which is a two-year moratorium on larger scale and denser developments in the city of LA to get plans uh, done, a general plan for the city, as well as community plans. It also calls for a number of other issues that we'll get to shortly. Later on, we're gonna talk about Los Angeles County's Measure H, a quarter cent sales tax increase to fund homeless services. But let's hear from an AirTalk listener who wants to ask a question of our two guests debating Measure S. This is Jeff from Hollywood. What aspects of Measure S would give neighbors more say in their neighborhood's future? Jill Stewart? Yeah, there are a couple of different things that the measure does, um, in addition to allowing almost all affordable housing and homeless housing to continue to be built. Um, and that is that you, do, you have two problems inside the city. One is the developers are allowed to write and control the environmental impact reports. This is a terrible conflict of interest. They claim, for example, again and again, that the traffic will not be disastrous from a project, and then we end up with incredible traffic from a project that a street just can't handle. They also get a pass on such things as having to report on brownfields that they're building housing next to. And the worst one, we think, is what we call the black lung loft problem, which is um, developers like Jeff Palmer, who are building right on the freeways, USC and UCLA have asked the city a number of times, they've testified, please don't allow children to move into freeway adjacent. We're talking about lifelong lung damage. The city will not le listen, and they're even allowing the developers to write those environmental impact reports. So how the, the listener asked, though, how, how will people in neighborhoods have additional input? How would this help that? So neighborhoods use the environmental impact report as a key lever of power to fight buildings that are illegal in their neighborhoods that tower over them and that the streets can't handle. But when the EIR is filled with lies, they don't have enough power and they can't point out the troubles and the pollution that's gonna be caused. That's one thing. Okay. We're also going to move the key hearings into the communities at night and on the weekends for proposals for the general plan and for your community plans. This is the single, um, thing I've heard from council members they're the angriest about, that they will have to go out into the communities at night and on the weekends to meet with the communities instead of have the communities come downtown at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. We think that this is a fundamental okay. democratic process. So Laura Raymond, how do you see the community being involved if S passes? Well, if S passes, we are gonna, we're gonna see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, a deepening of our housing crisis. We're, we're expecting more evictions of S passes. Actually, the organization that helped write and pass rent control in Los Angeles, Coalition for Economic Survival, they're saying that if Measure S passes, it's going to be an increase in eviction in rent controlled 
units. The community plan updates are very important. We are, as ACT LA, going to be very involved in that process. Some of our members have been involved in the Boyle Heights community plan updates, the South LA community plan updates, and that's already underway. So that's a, actually a problem you're not solving for. It's it's already but isn't underway. the city's general plan like 20 years old? Or yes, and so the community plans will the community plans will update the general plan. So the community plan process are underway now. They're they're going to be done within six years. That's already passed through the planning and land use uh, committee of city council. Um, but and not in two years as as this measure calls for. This this does not call for two years. It calls for five years. Um, the two year thing is a two year moratorium on zone changes. The general plan amendment ban of Measure S is permanent, and that would be a permanent ban to any changes to the general plan and that's a problem uh, we don't we don't want that in LA because uh, we do want to be sticking to the general plan but there's projects that we want some flexibility with for example if you want to build a homeless housing project or if you want to convert what was zoned for an industrial lot into a residential wow. building and the reason why that's a problem to 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 say you cannot turn a parking lot into a residential building is because if you can't do that, then you're gonna be building on rent controlled apartment buildings and you're gonna be increasing evictions. And that's why every single oh. housing rights organization in the city is but against But how do you address. get beyond then spot zoning? If, if, um, if you're not gonna have fully redone plans mm -hmm. that take into account all the neighborhood interest. You don't. You say you don't want the general plan changed. No, no, no. Okay. You do want the general plan. We are updating the community plans, and this is a process that, as I said, Act LA has been involved in. We're gonna we're gonna be convening community meetings around the general plan update and the community plan updates. But you don't want to say no general plan amendments ever again in Los Angeles because that's just shooting ourselves in the foot. We need some flexibility in case okay. we do want to, to change. So, Jill, the, the point yes. that this doesn't allow flexibility and general plans can't be nimble enough to change quickly enough to meet needs. You know, the general plan is actually a blueprint for the city. It's not supposed to be changed often. It's supposed to be updated every five years to keep up with what's going on in the city. The city council voted in 2005 to never have to update the general plan again, and nobody noticed. We in the media didn't notice that they'd done this. Um, so we're basically making them going back to doing their job. And because the general plan gets updated continuously every five years, um, really there's, there's not a whole lot of reasons to, um, to amend it. The, the city charter says that they cannot amend the general plan. It's not allowed for a single developer. And that's the problem, I think, that some of the housing um, advocates are getting involved in. They think that at some point they're going to have to need a general plan, which is extremely, extremely rare, a general plan amendment uh, for affordable housing. Almost all general plan amendments in Los Angeles are being used by very wealthy developers to create luxury housing. And this is our big beef, because when they put luxury housing into um, Koreatown, or a Westlake where I was the other day where the Westlake Neighborhood Council endorsed us. Um, these are working class Latinos who see the big fancy buildings going in which are not allowed by the zoning. Their area well, is gentrified and they're forced out. So you have to have, basically I'm saying, okay. you have to have a plan. The community plans are more um, down at the street level. The general plan is a bigger blueprint. Okay, and I understand that, that proponents of Measure S, one of your big arguments is that really what's being built is luxury housing, not affordable housing, but we have a supply demand problem in Los Angeles, right? So even if you're building more luxury housing, doesn't that to some degree uh, release the pressure lower on because as you're able to house more people, doesn't that take the pressure off even well, lower income? Um, I, I, su supply and demand doesn't really operate in, in the housing market because there's silos. Um, you know, it's, it's really a, um, a, pr a problem of creating an, an incredible glut of luxury housing right now. It's, it's a kind of a, you, you could almost do a sad play about what's going on in Los Angeles right now. We have a huge luxury housing glut, 12% vacancy rate and higher in everything built in LA in the last decade, according to the housing department's report to the mayor. So you have this huge glut, but nobody can find an apartment because there's no construction going on of regular housing. Okay. It's all luxury except for a tiny, tiny bit of affordable housing, and this Laura, is wrong. Laura Raymond, what, what effect on the overall housing market does luxury housing have? 
Well, luxury housing, we feel in Act LA, it's certainly a problem. We are, some of our members have actually been fighting some, some of the luxury housing developments coming in. We want more affordable housing. We want equitable development that serves the communities where the development is going in. But Measure S is not anything that will stop luxury development going into communities. It doesn't, it doesn't differentiate what you know, apartments cost in a building before it says whether a building could go forward or not. So this is mostly going to affect affordable housing and homeless housing projects because a luxury developer can afford to shop around and find a plot of land that's zoned for what they want to build. So if they can't build out a parking lot, they can go into a neighborhood, they can find a, a piece of land that's zoned residential, and they can build their apartment building there, evicting the tenants. That's what we're worried about. We're saying that you know, we've got to have equitable development. We've got to have sustainable development. We should be building close to transit, so we're getting people out of cars, using our transit system. We really want to move forward. We're at a point in LA where we have just pro passed in November equitable policy. We had overwhelming voter support. We want to move forward with these plans for affordable housing and homeless housing, and Measure S really rolls back that well, progress. We, if we I we could jump in well, just let a me, second. Let me, let, me, let me just interject. We hear that you know, this is the vision for Los Angeles. Let's make denser, mm -hmm. taller, bigger housing near transit where people can walk to transit. Yet all the studies I've seen show that the people that are moving into those units mm -hmm. still have cars. They want to be where the action is, the hip center of town. That's where, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily using public right. transit. So is, is that just instead creating more traffic and congested areas of the city not really getting people onto the light rail. Well, Larry, that's actually the exact reason why Act LA formed the Alliance for Community Transit, because we are seeing that transit ridership is dropping, and the reason why it's dropping is low-income people are getting displaced from neighborhoods where, where development is going in. And so we need equitable development. We need affordable development near transit. You don't think it's this gas is cheap and well, people are driving a lot more? Cause I mean... No, it, it's actually, there's a lot of transit dependent people in Los Angeles that get lost in the mix. Um, and so, they, like, 75% of core transit users make $25,000 and below each year. And so we really need to be building for that population, okay. and we're in a moment right now where that's possible. So let me right? just um, yeah, uh, comment, agree, agree completely with you. The luxury housing, which is almost exclusively what they're building at the transit stops, is shoving out our working class people who should be using and want to use the lines, and that's why the, the ridership has dropped. It's really unbelievable and outrageous that billions have been spent and we have fewer ridership. It's terrible. Okay. They're pushing them further and further away, let's, let's, spot zoning. Let's hear from another listener with a question. This is Sarah from Boyle Heights. For those opposed to Measure S, assuming you're concerned about the availability of housing and political corruption involved with building in LA, what changes would you make in the existing measure so that you could support it? So that's for you, Laura. If you could change anything, mm -hmm. what would you do? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I actually do think in Act LA that there is a problem with how we're planning in Los Angeles. We need more affordable housing and less luxury housing. Measure S does none of that. It actually does nothing to change how City Hall operates. For all they talk about corruption at City Hall, this does nothing to impact that. This is not a campaign finance reform measure. It does not stop luxury development going into neighborhoods. It, it will increase evictions of rent stabilized units. And so um, I would completely scrap the measure. I think what we need is if we're gonna deal with corruption at City Hall, let's, stop, let's ban developers from contributing to city council members when they have a project under how, review. How if, would if, I you may go, if I may oh, jump in. Just how would you, given all the time and effort that goes into updating plans, get the city to update the plans without having some sort of a, you know, a stick, mm -hmm. uh, like a Measure S, to force them in timely manner to update their plans. Yeah, so the, the city does need to update their plans, and the, the, planning, the planning updates are actually underway right now, so we're engaged in that. But there's, um, there's no definitive end time for that, is there? there well, it's, it, right now is a budgetary question. They're saying in the next six years, but we do need that budget. Um, and so the city needs to be funding the, the 
the community plan updates, but they've just hired 20 new planners in the planning department to, to update okay. the community plan. So that's yeah, Jill? Underway. Yeah, I wanted to say a couple things. Um, first of all, one of the reasons that we have the LA Tenants Union behind us, they are the only unaffiliated group that takes no money, doesn't need anything from City Hall, doesn't need any kind of um, letter of recommendation from City Hall. They're completely independent, and they do not agree that our measure would in any way hurt them. They're being hurt now. The status quo system right now is the track record. It is reality. Um, Gail Goldberg, the city planner from a decade ago, warned that if we continued to allow zoning to be changed by developers, we would end up with a disaster in LA. We have a huge disaster. We have homelessness spiking when there's low employment, low unemployment. We have people moving to the streets because they're being shoved out of Skid Row. The average rent on Skid Row now is $1,600 a month. Think about that a minute. The beds on Skid Row are being okay. removed for luxury right. so hotels. Jill, yeah, I'm sorry, I just gotta move along here. But the fact is, I know Alice Callahan supports Measure S, but when you look at the organizations that are the homeless, or I, say, I know you say they're, that they're dependent on the city, but they're also heavily dependent on donors, all of those organizations. If they really believed that Measure S would be beneficial to them, you think just because of their relationship with the city that they would, so, uh, you know, that they would go against it? I, I think it's a difficult situation. As a journalist, I would say, when you get caught up in a broken system and you become dependent on a broken system, you're afraid to mess with this broken system. And the system is broken, and we have a disaster unfolding in the city. There is absolutely no reason why we should have a luxury housing glut pushing people out of their neighborhoods, especially working class Latino and black neighborhoods. Um, so I think that, you know, to some degree, you have very good organizations who think there's no way out. They think that they have got to ask for the crumbs because that's all they're going to get. And we're saying, actually, you, you, you cannot keep doing this by the seat of your pants. We're a huge city. We okay. have a disaster Laura, unfolding created by this very lack of planning, thought, and debate. It's terrible. Laura, your, re your response to that, that the homeless advocacy groups are, are just kowtowing to the city here. Honestly, I think you know that's a that's a pretty insulting. I didn't say that. Th that's a pretty okay. insulting. Well, what, say, say. what what's what's a better term than cowtown? I think that they are afraid to mess with the system that they've gotten caught up in and that they're used to. I think it's very hard to change your ways when you are used to something, even if it's not working well, even if it doesn't produce okay. hardly any of okay. what you want. So Laura, it's hard to break so out. So the groups that are opposing Measure S are very broad very diverse we have la community action network which has been you know out there on the front lines fighting for people living on skid row every day we've got community uh, coalition for economic survival which is also out there fighting for tenant rights going up against the city every single day uh, we have the aclu uh, public council okay. groups that okay. are fighters you know we're not kowtowing to the city obviously okay well so uh, so and that's my term admittedly so let's Let's close Thank out. <laughs> let's let's close out by um, asking your vision two years from now. If Measure S passes, Jill, what's your vision of what the city looks like? Well, we'll have um, regular meetings out in the communities about what the communities want to become. Many communities want more density, and they want the city to pay attention to them, and that has not happened. Um, you're going to have a lot more discussion. Um, you're going to have regular building going on. 95% of all development in Los Angeles is what's called by right. That will continue. It'll be okay. very robust construction everywhere in the city, but there will be fewer mega developments. There will be fewer of these Laura, mega developments. what do you see two years after this passes? If Measure S passes, we're going to have a lot more evictions in the city of LA. And, and we're really worried about this as an organization that works day in and day out on behalf of renters. Uh, we'll also, we will still have luxury development going in around the city. We will be blocking a lot of the great projects that groups have okay. been working for years to plan. I want to thank both of you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, talking about uh, Measure S next Tuesday on your LA City Ballot. Coming up in the next hour, Measure H on the Los Angeles County Ballot, quarter uh, cent sales tax increase for homeless services. We'll be back right after this.
So now we have an opportunity for questions for Laura and Jill about Measure S. So if you want to hold your hand up, you got a card with a question on it. We will collect them. We have a couple people in the room here. Just hold your hand up. We have one right here. <coughs> Anybody else with a question on Measure S? Yeah, okay. Just, uh, and please put your name. Make sure that you, you great. Uh, Mark in beautiful Windsor Hills, if you come right up. Some of the best views of the city in Windsor Hills. Mm. Hold on, your mic's not on, Mark. Let's get you uh, so we can hear you. Ready? Yeah, yes. there we go. Okay. My name's Mark. I'm from Windsor Hills. Uh, I've heard the word about affordable units or affordable housing. What is the definition price-wise of what is affordable? Mm -hmm. Who wants to start well, with Well, in Los Angeles, uh, uh, roughly a uh, family of four can make up to about forty-five dollars or $50,000 a year and still qualify for affordable. There's actually various definitions of affordable housing. So you have extremely low-income housing, low-income housing, and very low-income housing. Sorry, extremely low, very low, and, and low-income. Um, you also have permanent supportive housing. Um, and so there's various thresholds, right? Like extremely low-income housing would be about $17,000 to $19,000 a year. So that is extremely low. Um, and our, pr our Proposition JJJ that we passed in November, it actually mandates extremely low-income housing and or and very low income housing or low income housing, but extremely low income housing is mandated in buildings. All right, next is Joe in Mount Washington. We're only taking people who live in communities with great views. That's, <laughs> that's so if you don't live in a place with great views, you can't ask questions. Uh, Hold on, we don't have your mic on. All right, go right ahead. Uh, if Measure S does not pass, has any thought been given to other ways to disrupt the council developer complex that exists now in the city of Los Angeles? Well, right. the city council has, um, <laughs> yes, applause, thank you. Uh, the city council has, has proposed that they themselves will stop taking developer money. Um, if you believe that, I will sell you a bridge in Arizona. Um, they're not going to do, go through with those kinds of reforms. One thing that was said earlier, I think that I wanted to exp exp just go a little bit further on, we're ending a lot of the backroom deals. That is real reform. We're, we, we couldn't do a campaign finance reform because then it would be viewed as a two-issue ballot measure and that those are illegal. So we decided to go against the backroom deals that are going on in LA. It's called spot zoning where you give a developer what they want after they've speculated on a piece of land. Now if this doesn't pass, that will continue apace. They are not going to slow down. They have a bunch of uh, reforms that they've proposed. All of them have gone to committee for study. Every single thing that the council has proposed has gone to committee for study. Some of it's been studied for six months now. So I, as a cynical journalist, admittedly, do not trust the city council when, says they're gonna, they, when they say they're going to reform themselves. Okay. Uh, Laura, what, what do you think would be an alternative to clean up the system if S doesn't pass? Mm -hmm. So Joe mentioned that there is this proposal before city council. Um, we'll watch and see what happens with that. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, the real problem with the housing crisis is lack of affordable housing and, and lack of enough renter protections, right? We need tenant protections in place. We need to repeal the Ellis Act because the Ellis Act is being used to evict, it's been a, used to evict 22,000 people from their homes since 2000. Um, we need good uh, tenant protections and we need affordable housing being built. Um, and so it's, it's really a question, when we talk about the housing crisis, it's less about the planning tools and it's more about just what, how, that people can't afford housing, that people are homeless on the streets and we really need solutions. We've got a really robust uh, housing movement here in LA that's working on solutions, but Measure S would really take away some of the tools that but, we need. But what about the pay to play environment? What would really change that in, in your view? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we, like, like I said before, an actual campaign finance bill where developers couldn't, couldn't actually uh, donate to a city council member if they have a project before review, I think that would be a great idea that would go a long way. Uh, Jill, I wanted to ask you, some um, folks look at the fact that AIDS Healthcare Foundation, Michael Weinstein has, uh, got this all started, and there are those who say, this really is about that Weinstein didn't want you know this big development to go next to AIDS Healthcare Foundation's headquarters, and so you know uh, sort of attached his personal view onto this. What's your response to that skepticism? Well, first of all, that is such a huge lie. I don't know uh, whether I'm even going to answer that one, but let's put it this well, why way: would he, Why AIDS, would he support this? Give a reason. AIDS Healthcare Foundation is currently treating 700,000 people with AIDS around the world. Based on ability, uh, regardless of ability to pay, they're saving hundreds of thousands of lives. It's an incredible organization that I've gotten to know in the last year. Really amazing group. What they see in every country, including the United States, is after their medications, the number one need of their patients is housing. They are housing challenged, they are homeless, they are about to become homeless. It's devastating. Now, when they saw this developing in Los Angeles, in their own backyards, because most of this they'd seen in places like the Deep South where they have clinics, they said, we, we, we have to act. This is a social justice issue in our own backyard. And that is one of the reasons that we're working closely with Elena Pop, who I think is the top anti-eviction attorney in California. She's amazing. She keeps people in their houses who are being illegally pushed out by, frankly, greedy developers. But and she is working okay. with us. We think the key issue is um, make the city watch what? the rules, follow the rules, stop allowing the evictions. The city isn't even having a discussion about so this. So you take issue with the LA Times uh, analysis they did that overwhelmingly the evictions are under the Ellis Act to do condos, things like that, aren't the the new, the larger projects that S would cover, that that, that wouldn't affect Well, those. you're talking about the two-year moratorium. We're talking about the whole future of the city and that's why we go way beyond the moratorium with the general plan that has to be written in community plans. We think that once you open up the city to a debate about what kind of city do we want to become, not a closed door debate with some developers, but to the entire city, then there will be a discussion about, wait a minute, how come we're seeing this incredible, what I call a new level of greed in Los Angeles? Everyday landlords, if you think about this, back as we were approaching Hanukkah, we all saw the story about those elderly people, 90 years and older, in Westwood, they got their eviction notices. This is new for Los Angeles. I've been writing about urban affairs all my life. I have never seen anything like the greed. And I, my argument is the city council is okay. creating a culture of greed by taking money from developers, letting them get away with murder, and saying okay. it's okay to the whole city. Okay, uh, Laura, your response to that? Yeah, so Jill just mentioned the Westwood Senior development. The Westwood Seniors in, that are being pushed out of a senior home so it can be converted into a, a more expensive senior home, um, they're being represented by Beth Zedek, a, a, a pro bono law firm that actually opposes Measure S. They say more situations like that will occur if Measure S passes. They're urging people to vote no. And I would say if the AIDS Healthcare Foundation was truly interested in solving for affordable housing issue in Los Angeles, they should have come and talked to housing groups. We're the experts on this. They, they've spent $4.6 million on this campaign. If just a fraction of that had been spent on some of the tenant rights fights in the city, we, we would be a lot further along than we are now. Let's uh, hear from Bill in Echo Park. Bill, you want to come right on up? Or we'll come to you, better yet. Oh, uh, yeah, I do have a question. I live in Echo Park, Silver Lake area, and it's one of the areas that's gentrifying, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. It used to be very unsafe. Uh, I am a planner by training, and I worked for government uh, a long time. And I'm also a gay male, and I know the AIDS Project, and that's an excellent organization in many ways. But the th my question is, why do you think that uh, the uh, th that it, if S does not pass, that there would be a great number more of evictions? I, mm -hmm. I don't really understand that. 
I can tell you that okay. if you have to go with local planning uh, as a planner, that if you have to do all these neighborhood plans, n you cannot do it in two years. It's all right, all yeah. right. So, Laura, you want to respond to that? Why do you think more evictions? Yeah, if absolutely. Passes? So, if S passes, you are not going to be able to get zone changes or general plan amendments as a developer. In in zone, a zone change and general plan amendment, as that LA Times study that um, Larry just cited found, they are they are mostly on. Uh, land that's not already zoned residential. Um, so you can't build residential building. Think of like a parking lot or an industrial warehouse. And the, and the zoning says you can't build a residential building here. And so a, a developer gets a zone change to enable them to build that. If they're not able to do that, they're going to go to plots of land that are already zoned residential where there's already people living. And that's why a lot of uh, tenant rights groups are very afraid that when this passes, there will be more evictions. Jill? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, you know, we were, as I said, we are working with Alina Pop, and she is seeing, and I, I think her data is correct, a skyrocketing level of illegal eviction. It's become an industry in Los Angeles to illegally evict amidst this boom in luxury housing construction. So what's happened is, I think, because people are being, I think, there is a, a dramatic upsurge in it's okay to be greedy. It's okay to be a bad landlord. It's okay to push people out who've been in your apartment for a lot of years. It's okay to manipulate the system. Our city council's doing it. Uh, all of their contributors are doing it. Why shouldn't we do it? So the tr only trickle down I see happening in Los Angeles is bad behavior is trickling down to everyday landlords who never ever would have considered behaving the way they are right now. And I think that deserves a major public discussion, a, a complete rethinking of where we're going as a city, what is right and wrong in a big city. We're not having that discussion right now. Kay. Measure S is, is forcing that discussion right now. That's why we're here tonight. All right, I need to close, and I want to thank you both so much for being with us, talking about Measure X next uh, Tuesday on the Los Angeles City Ballot. Thanks so much, Jill thank Stewart. You. Thank yes you. Yes on S. <laughs> and our thanks as well to uh, Laura, who uh, represents an organization that uh, works on homeless services. Laura Raymond's group is the Alliance for Community Transit. Thank you both very much for being with us. Appreciate it. And we're going to pick right up with Measure H, the Los Angeles County quarter cent sales tax increase. Thank you both very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good to see you, too. Thank you. So we'll bring up our next panel. So Rena Palta, KPCC reporter, is going to come right up next to me. And then we've got Chris Coe of United Way. So you, you brought your entourage, Chris, huh? That's nice. <laughs> Rebecca Prine, Recycled Resources for the Homeless. And Veronica Lewis of Hopix. And Jack Humphreyville of City Watch. So we'll get all of you up here. And Tony, do you mind grabbing uh, Laura's bottle and taking that uh, sure. away once you're done getting the mic set? Thank you. Okay, Tony, whenever you're set. All right. From the Crawford Family Forum at KPCC, this is the AirTalk in-person voter game plan. I'm Larry Mantle. Great to have you with us as we're going to spend this entire hour 
focused on Los Angeles County's Measure H. Next Tuesday, voters will go to the polls to decide whether to increase the sales tax by a quarter of a cent. The money would go to homeless services uh, for higher sales tax cities like Long Beach, for example. It would put the overall sales tax rate at 10%. Two-thirds voter approval is required for H to pass. We're going to hear the pros and cons of the measure, but also look at where the money might go and how that would fit with programs already providing services for the county's homeless residents. Let's begin with KPCC's correspondent covering our local social safety net, Rena Palta. Rena, great to have you with us. Uh, so let me start with you. How does H fit with the city of LA's measure HHH, which overwhelmingly passed last November. Well, these were really planned more or less in tandem with each other. Uh, proposition HHH, which passed, I think, with six, or 76 to 77 percent of the vote in November, was really meant to build the buildings uh, to house people who are currently homeless. So that's the brick and mortar piece of this. Uh, Measure H is supposed to come in from the county, which traditionally runs uh, social services. Um, and it's supposed to basically put the services along alongside those buildings and also fund things that prevent homelessness and um, you know folks who are kind of on the cusp. But there's no or is there some temporary housing included here or just all services? So part of the county, the county has a long list of strategies, about four dozen strategies that they want to fund. Um, Measure H could go to any number of those. Some of them do include temporary rental assistance. Um, you know, there's this thing called rapid rehousing that people might have heard of uh, that goes to individuals, also goes to families. It's basically rental assistance for up to two years. And so it's very possible that Measure H could expand the county's use of that as well. And what's the projection on how much money a year this would raise for the 10-year life of the tax? Sure, it's expected to raise is about $350 million a year. That's a little bit short of what uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority has estimated the county actually needs to fund all these programs, but it is a significant chunk. All right, and um, let's uh, hear from a listener who has a question about H. Hi, this is Tom from Los Feliz. The voters just approved HHH and JJJ a few months ago, so I'm curious, how would Measure S affect Measure HHH, the one that approved a $1.2 billion homeless bond, and Measure JJJ, which enacted minimum affordable housing requirements in LA County. Rena, do you want to take that on? So, um, is there articulation between the two with the city and county working together with those measures? Well, the county and the city have not historically worked very well together when it comes to combating homelessness. Um, you or, might see or a lot of other things, right? Not just that, <laughs> you uh, might see, you know, the evidence of that on our streets right now. Um, but they really have been trying to work together to to get everybody on the same page. Now that was, uh, you know, with this new board of supervisors that came in in November. This was really, I think, the city and county's opportunity to see if they could all get on the same page. They do seem to be communicating a lot more than they used to. Also with us is Chris Co, Director of Homeless Initiatives for the United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Chris, good to have you with us. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Um, so how are these awards going to be given out by the city, the grants, or uh, how are they going to fund the programs? Who's going to be the decision maker? Sure. I think the decision maker for these grants will ultimately be the community and us. Um, as voters and also as the general public. Practically speaking, they'll be given out mostly to community-based organizations and also directly to our homeless neighbors. So a lot of them will go directly in support of rental subsidies and services delivered by our community-based organizations. Um, the fancy term for that is the Notice of Funding Availability. So every year, there's a community-based process through which the grants are given out whether by the Homeless Services Authority or directly by the county, but they will largely be given um, directly to community-based organizations. And uh, is there going to be a chance, uh, to your knowledge, for uh, new organizations to establish themselves and potentially qualify, or pretty much do you have to be in this field already uh, to be given money by the county? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge reason why we're really excited about this measure, which is that we've been testing community-based approaches and structures to deliver this for years. 
And the problem has been when you're dealing with a set and small pie, there's no space for some of the more nimble, innovative, newer community-based efforts to join that mix. And so we're really excited that this finally provides the resources for some of the newer organizations to get um, into the field. And some organizations who need more experienced partners, we also run something at United Way called the Funders Collaborative that marries public and private dollars together so that newer, um, fresher organizations that might be smaller and less experienced can get off the ground and get the seed funding to then marry with these larger public resources that will be available. And what about the um, oversight of this? Sure. Uh, you know, who's going to be on the commission or whatever the group is called that oversees this and actually determines that positive results are coming? Yeah, great question, Larry. So technically, it's and this is something we pushed for um, seriously at United Way in our Home for Good initiative, which is a joint initiative with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we pushed for an oversight committee, so there will be a five-person citizen oversight committee where they required people with budgetary accounting expertise and uh, homeless services expertise over 10 years to be part of that, but and an independent audit. But I think more importantly than that, what we were most excited about is that the county put very clear benchmarks that will be transparently packed uh, tracked. So 45,000 families and individuals within the first five years will be housed, their homelessness will be ended. 30,000 more families and individuals will prevent their homelessness in the first five years. So those benchmarks will be tracked. And then indicators, three indicators, returns to homelessness, length of time homeless, um, and also those permanent housing placements. We found at United Way that having clear benchmarks and having clear indicators combined with the plans of which there was a year-long community planning process are the most important, even more than just an oversight committee, that ongoing real-time tracking we feel like is the most important part of accountability. We're talking with Chris Coe of the United Way of Greater Los Angeles, also with us, uh, the founder of Recycled Resources for the Homeless, which advocates for and provides resources for uh, those in Northeast Los Angeles, Rebecca Prime. Thank you, Rebecca, for being with us. How might your organization use additional resources to serve your community? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm the only one up here without anything written down because I did want to genuinely speak from my heart to your listeners. Um, Recycled Resources for the Homeless is a community-based nonprofit organization. So um, thus far, our budget is on the smaller side. Our budget was the most last year at about $30,000, which primarily we raised from the community itself. So. We don't have any um, county contracts, city contracts. Uh, we basically started the organization because there was no homeless service provider in Northeast Los Angeles, which was very frustrating and heartbreaking to those of us in the organization. Um, the reason I'm, I'm endorsing, we are endorsing and very excited about Measure H is because I believe, and I'm hopeful that this will allow um, community-based organizations like ours to move forward and do more effective work. So for example, right now, we're volunteer based. So all of us come after work to do what we do or we come on the weekends. We have 1,200 um, individuals experiencing homelessness in our community who we have surveyed, who we have gotten into this massive coordinated entry system, who are basically awaiting the resources for housing. You do have a winter uh, shelter, I know, I saw on your website. Correct. We are operating one of the only winter shelters um, in the basic Hollywood downtown northeast area. Um, and we only offer 35 beds. That's all we were able to offer. Um, we're located inside of a church. In Highland um, Park. In right. Highland Park, which was a little difficult to do because there was um, some barriers to overcome in terms of people sleeping in pews or people sleeping on the floor. It wasn't the traditional way to go about a winter shelter, but we've been very successful, too successful, turning away over 10 people. So you'd be able to expand potentially, have more beds available Absolutely. for people, and you'd be able to hire some staff perhaps so that it wouldn't just be volunteers on their own time. Absolutely, and it wouldn't just be for when it's cold. We look to have some type of year-round shelter. Um, it, while we're waiting for this this housing to be built, we're seeing people deteriorate on the streets, which is so difficult for us to do. We're hopeful that the housing will be built, but without the supportive services 
to help people navigate the system, they're stuck on the street and they're stuck without housing. So many areas of Southern California have seen the rise of encampments, but in Northeast Los Angeles, it's particularly visible along Arroyo Seco, uh, under uh, overpass. I mean, it's just, you've seen an explosion in your part of the city. Absolutely, and that's one thing that also I'm hopeful is that Measure H will allow us to think and work outside of the box. So for example, in Eagle Rock, which is in Northeast, there is um, over 20 RVs that are camped right along um, an overflow parking lot for a park that I literally have never seen open other than 4th of July. So funding for a safe parking initiative where RV campers can get off the street, get into this parking lot that is never utilized, put some bathrooms, put some case management staff in there to help them exit their homelessness. Yeah, that lot is used for filming is about the only thing I ever, I know the lot you're talking about on Figueroa. Uh, We're talking with uh, Rebecca Prine of Recycled Resources for the Homeless. I want to start with Veronica Lewis and we'll continue after our break, but she's Division Director, uh, Special Service for Groups of the Homeless Outreach Program Integrated Care System known as HOPIX, which serves South Los Angeles. Veronica, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. So what, what would Measure H mean for your service provider, the kinds of things you do in your community? Well, we are a service provider as well, but we have actually been intricately involved in the rollout of the public investment. So I know firsthand what works, what doesn't work, and I know um, what the gaps are. So for the last four years, we've been working on the coordinated entry system. It really was an organic process that started with no resources at all where service providers came together under the leadership of United Way and really started to look at how can we reduce the silos because obviously people were bouncing from place to place to place. Um, And then that grew and I truly believe that that impacted the political will we now see to have public investment. And so as one of the operators of some of the millions of dollars that have hit the ground recently, um, we know intricately what the gaps are. And we also know what the best practices are and what interventions actually work to get people off of the street. And so Measure H would allow us to expand and take it to scale. And I just want to make one distinction. You know, yes, we see on the ground that the city and county are coordinating and aligning resources and policies like never before. But Prop HHH and Measure H are not one in the same. Measure H really is the missing link. And so you can have all the housing you want, but if you don't have system navigation, if you don't have field-based outreach for people that are living on the street and may take a little bit more um, time before they're ready to move to the next step, if you don't have mental health, substance use, rental subsidies, buildings don't matter. And so Measure H is a complement to Prop HHH, but it's completely different. And we know what works. We've seen it. We've housed hundreds of people in the last 18 months just with the public investment and over a 1,000 in the last nine years and so Measure H will allow us to do more of that work and literally get people off the street. All right, we'll continue our conversation with our guests as we talk about Los Angeles County Measure H. It's a quarter cent sales tax increase. It must pass by two-thirds or more of county voters if it's going to be implemented. We'll continue with this voter game plan from our Crawford Family Forum right after this live update. Just want to remind you to be thinking of questions for our panelists for after uh, our next couple of segments. From the Crawford Family Forum at KPCC, this is Air Talk's in person voter game plan. <laughs> Great to have you with us. I'm Larry Mantle as we talk about Measure H on the LA County ballot. Uh, it's a quarter cent sales tax increase to fund homeless services. And we have uh, a whole panel of people that are supporting Measure H, plus our reporter, Rena Palta, who covers the Southern California Social Safety Net. And uh, though there is no organized opposition to Measure H, uh, there is a critic of Measure H and the way it goes about uh, providing money for homeless services. Jack Humphreyville, Jack, not that you're disorganized, but you're not part of a formal, formal movement about this. What are your concerns about using the sales tax to fund this? Am I on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my basic issue is one of priorities. And here the, the, the county who has seen about a three or four billion dollar increase in its revenues over the last several years, they can't find 350 million dollars. They tell us, it's, they tell us homelessness 
<coughs> is a priority, uh, but they don't put it into the budget. But then when they want to raise our taxes, they then, and especially a regressive tax, uh, as the sales tax is, they all of a sudden make it a priority. So, you know, you have an issue where, you know, they're picking our pockets, you know, pulling at our heartstrings when they really should have been going out there and making this a priority. I think the other thing is, is, you know, when are enough taxes enough taxes? Uh, just in November, you know, for the city people of the city of Los Angeles, we basically had, we approved about $896 million worth of taxes, which has is the equivalent of about a 20% increase in our real estate taxes. And now they have, you know, they're sort of thinking about a bunch of other things ranging from the city wants a street bond for about, you know, three or four billion dollars. We have a linkage fee. Uh, this county obviously has the sales tax. Uh, Sheila Kuehl's working on a stormwater tax, which would probably be about a billion dollars a year. South Coast Management, uh, Air Quality uh, Management Districts, looking at about a $300 million uh, vehicle license fee. And then you have the state where they want to have a gas tax, where they want to expand the sales tax. And if you throw those all together, and the impact, if you, just if you're Angelino, you live in the city of Los Angeles, is about a 60% increase in our real estate taxes. And you take all this together, and you, everybody's saying we want jobs, jobs, jobs. I can't think of anything better if I live in Nevada or Texas and I'm trying to recruit, you know, going out there and recruit. We've seen we've lost Nestle, we've lost Toyota, we've lost Occidental, we've lost a lot of other businesses here. And if we, you know, tank our economy, who's going to pay for all these things? The, the flip side, of course, is you can argue that the homelessness in Los Angeles County is also, uh, a re I mean, aside from the human cost for the individuals who are suffering, that, that there is also a societal cost to that, and that that affects companies being willing to work here, the quality of life for Angelinos, perceptions of, of safety and, and, and uh, sanitation and all the like. Uh, couldn't you argue that this money is an investment in an improvement in the quality of life, not just for those who are going to directly be helped, but everybody? Yeah. You know, I'm not denying that homelessness is a problem. What the problem is is that the, ci the city and the county have not made this a priority. And then they come out there and they say we need to do HHH, which is the $1.2 billion bond that's going to cost us $63 million a year on average over the next 30 years. They have a, they come up with a half cent sales tax, or quarter cent sales tax, excuse me, for $350 million a year for 10 years. And they again pull at our, our, our heartstrings. The city had an increase in revenues over the last four years of a billion dollars, and they can't find $63 million. Hello? You have the county that's been up about three or four billion dollars, and they can't find $300 million. So well, it's, a question, this, it's a question of priorities. Isn't part of this, though, that they're servicing um, all the pension increases that they've had to deal with that have taken an ever larger part of the city and county budgets. Well, I think if you really start to look at it and you look at the pet projects and then you look at the wage increases, those are the biggies. Yes, pension, pensions, I think, at the county are about a billion eight, uh, you know, which are up substantially. But the wage increases, the pet projects, and all the other goodies, uh, you know, whatever it is, they haven't made homelessness a priority until they want to pick our pockets. So what would you cut if you were going to try and come up with the money within the county's budget? What do you think could go to come up with $350 million a year? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a student particularly of the, of the county's budget. You know, it's a $30 billion budget. You ought to be able to find some money there, whether it's, you know, so, you know other social services. Uh, you know, oh, how about a little bit of efficiencies? I mean, every day you pick up the paper, there's some, something going wrong at the county, whether it's a child services, where kids are dying, and you know, there's all sorts of issues that are going on. I think maybe a little bit better management. But, but again, I'm not an expert on the county's finances. Okay, Can Chris I Cove, United Way. Yeah, absolutely, if I, could, I would love to speak to that. I mean, I think we should all be fiscally prudent um, with all of our uh, resources, which is why as United Way, and again, since it's a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce, the first thing we asked was could there be a way to use the existing county budget. So we did sit down with budget experts privately, actually, didn't tell the county about it before choosing to jump behind this measure. Because to be very clear, this was not something the county was trying to sneak by us. This was something that we showed up with 500 to 1,000 people at the boardroom demanding that the county put on the ballot. Um, so it was a community different uh, initiative. But when we looked at the, the budget with the experts, it is simply not true that the county has the money to spend on this. Seventy-five percent of the budget is restricted federal and state pass-through funds. Ten percent additionally are funds that need to be matched to unlock those federal funds. 
Of the remaining dollars, half of those are public safety funds. So at the end of the day, the best way for us as voters and community members to demand this to be a priority over the length of time it would take to address this issue is to pa put it on the ballot to protect it from the year-by-year -year political budgeting and to make it the priority that we all believe it is. Jack, you want to respond to that? Uh, I, have, I have two comments. One is if they wanted to protect the budget, they could do what the city does for the you know, Department of Rec and Parks and for the library department where they say a certain percentage of the assessed value of the county's budget goes to, let's say, homelessness. I think the second thing is, is that the, the supervisors just passed a resolution the other day uh, back in February 14th where they, they, they said that they wanted to see if somebody, if the CEO could report back on all the stuff that they're doing for the homeless, which means to me they really don't have a good idea of where they're spending their money at this point in time. All right. Uh, uh, yes, you wanted to, uh, Veronica Lewis, <coughs> talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's very clear evidence that homelessness is a priority for the county of Los Angeles and certainly as the the 47 strategy initiative is at the ground and other money they found in the coffers has come out like I said we've been looking at this and really trying to reduce waste trying to minimize silos and really have a coordinated effort of not only nonprofit organizations but multiple city departments multiple county departments and so we understand now more than ever what our gap is and at this point, we're at crisis levels. And so if you have a crisis, if you have a medical condition that happens within your own personal life, you know what I mean, you may try to, may have to pull, may have to stop going to the movies or stop going out to eat or something like that to pay for your medical costs. But if it's something that's life or death, which homelessness is, then you're gonna have to figure out how to get an insurgence of dollars to address that because you can't only, you can only pull so much. And that's the situation that we're in. The county has looked at how can they realign dollars, how can they repurpose dollars out of the criminal justice system, and all that work, I would say, is still going on. But at this point, when you have 47,000 people every night, including children, without a place to live, it takes a special political will, it takes a special opportunity that only the voters can, can say yay or nay to for us to address this. And this is not lifelong. I don't know if that was said in the opening statement. This is it's not years. ongoing. It's 10 years. And so we're in crisis. And what do you do when you're in crisis? You make special effort to address the crisis situation. And that's what this is. How, however, I'm trying to recall any of these temporary taxes that have ever does anyone know of one that's ever really gone away and hasn't, hasn't been, there's probably some example, but I, I don't know. Well, I would love the day, come 10 years, where there's public outcry because there's nobody homeless again, and you guys say, take it off the ballot, but let's get there. Uh, all right. Uh, Jack, do you, do you have concerns about uh, the oversight of, of the money, how it would be spent, or do you feel like the county is, is competently going to be able to oversee that? I, I have no faith in that at all. Uh, the, the count in the, in the ballot measure, they're going to set up this advisory committee. It has some fancy name, oversight and account. You know, it's got a bunch of words in it. But this advisory committee is going to have five independent people who are appointed by the supervisors. Two of them are supposed to have some kind of expertise. But you tell me how five individuals with no staff are going to be o be able to oversee a very complex organization very solving a very complex problem in a, re in a reasonable basis. I don't think we have a clue as to what this, I don't think the advisory committee will have a clue. I would also say that, you know, you're, you're, this is going to be bumped up to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you know, they've had all these management issues and who's the CEO and I think Bill, whatever is Fujioka, left because of a sort of a power struggle. Um, so they want to oversee this at the county level. Well, you know, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, none of these guys on the, um, you know, on the city council have any organizational experience at all. You mean the board of supervisors? Well, the, yeah. yeah, the supervisors. None of them have any organizational experience at all of running a, a massive organization with 100,000 people and, you know, a $30 billion budget. Now, you know, I don't know how much the county's spending right now on the homeless, but let's say they're spending three, four, five hundred million. So you're talking about a, you know, a seven hundred and fifty million dollar, you know, or deal a year. They're not going to have a clue. So I, I have real questions about the oversight. Chris Coe of United Way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why earlier on when you asked about Larry, I think that's part of why I have more faith and part of why we pushed for the benchmarks and the indicators because that's what we found to be the greatest uh, 
the greatest provider of accountability. I think the way any business runs, the way any effective organization runs, you have a dashboard with clear, transparent, real-time measures, Can you and that's the means by which you are those in the, Are those in the ballot measure? They are in the ballot language and something that we've agreed to as part of the um, oversight of can, the work. Can you give an example of one of the benchmarks, for example, yeah. that would be used to, to test this? Absolutely. So the three I mentioned before, the overall, the overall benchmark is about ending homelessness for families and individuals. So that's where in the first five years, 45,000 families and individuals. So that's the overall benchmark. 30,000 lives prevented from becoming homelessness from becoming homeless in the first five years. So those are the overall benchmarks. Within them, the top three indicators would be returns to homelessness at a system level and per program, length of time from engagement within a program to the time it takes for them to exit homelessness. Um, and then, of course, again, placements from the street into those permanent housing. And, and not to you know question um, the honesty of the organization, because sure. these organizations are mission-driven and a great sacrifice to staff members and volunteers do this. Mm -hmm. So, but um, who who's going to sure. determine that the numbers are really accurate? Because every organization's under a lot of pressure to show they're doing great stuff. No, that's a that's an absolutely fair question, and I will turn it over to our friends here because they can tell you about how seriously those audits happen. Because both with the participation and the county's input, I think to be to be quite frank. The problem is not, la uh, it's not going to be that the county asks for enough input. Um, the problem might be that there are so many inputs required and asked for. So the participation by community providers is not a, at all a question in my mind. But in terms of how those documents will be proven, uh, the number of lease, so having lease copies of the lease at the time of housing is required to have in the documentation and the paperwork. Homelessness verification is required to do a multi-step verification process. So you're going to have to have staff to produce all this documentation. Right. Uh, and and uh, Rebecca Prine, your organization, Northeast LA, where you said you really raise your own money and, and all, does that concern you that as you grow, if you're going to get this money, you're going to have to come up with all this documentation? It doesn't concern me because on a much smaller scale, we are doing that now. So although we operate the winter shelter at night, it's kind of like an overnight access center. So we are already working with people to secure IDs and social security cards and establish income so we can link them to housing opportunities that exist. So if we had money to have full-time staff, we would be much more effective. Um, part of what I'm, I'm challenged with right now is that we're talking about the fourth of a penny. And how many pennies that you walk over on the street and they're just pennies, nobody seems to care about them, and how little this is going to, in my opinion, how small a contribution this is going to be from a taxpayer when we have, as you said, 47,000 people that are homeless, many of whom I have seen pass away on the sidewalk. If we don't do anything, if we don't, if we don't pass this measure, and we don't get the money, how many more people are we prepared to see turn homeless in our neighborhoods, build encampments in our neighborhoods. They are our neighbors. They are not going away. They're not going to magically get onto a shuttle and, and go you know, to, the, to the middle of you know, another county. Um, we need to be responsible for them. I feel like it's a community problem. And as a, as a taxpayer, I have an ability to contribute something that's going to help solve the problem. Well, but even Jack admits you know, it's only a quarter cent. But it's cumulative that there's er all these very high priorities. A where billion here, a billion there, and pretty, so, so pretty soon we're talking about no money. Is, is let me go back to Rena Palta, yeah. our, our correspondent on the social safety net in Southern California. It is a regressive tax to use a sales tax, meaning that uh, lower income people disproportionately uh, pay more of their income this way. Uh, were, were there discussions of using other vehicles to raise this money? There were a lot of discussions on how to raise this money that took place over uh, the course of a long time. That's part of the reason that this was not on the November ballot. Um, they simply couldn't, the Board of Supervisors could not come to an agreement on how to best raise this money. They looked into, you know, taxing marijuana. They looked into just a variety of means of doing this. Um, and this was thought to be the most uh, streamlined way to do it and kind of the most fair. Uh, one of the, one of the, um, 
last considerations that I saw go into this was whether to make it a special tax or not, whether to uh, set themselves up to have to go for the two-thirds of the general vote. And in the end, I think they decided as an accountability measure that they had to, they had to do it this way. They had to say, we are going to spend. We will commit in writing that we will spend this in a certain way. Um, and so I think that's how the sales tax developed. I, I think Chris was probably in on the discussions on this too, and he could probably talk more to it, but this came out of a long process. All right, yeah, Chris, yeah. just briefly. Yeah, I will add, um, in terms of the regressive nature, a millionaire's tax was considered. It does not, there, no, uh, the reason the sales tax was chosen, there is no other measure that raises nearly enough to t fully and appropriately tackle the problem. So in making a promise to voters, we wanted there to be a source that had sufficient resources to tackle it. The sales tax was the best way to do that. And I would tell you... Yeah, it's probably a lot less volatile. Yes. If you if you did a very wealthy person's tax, their, their taxable exposure goes way up and down uh, with the market. And um, if it was marijuana tax, something like that, I mean, who knows how much that would raise. That's right. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, Larry, is that we are already paying for this. So as distinct from uh, a measure to build more parks or more X, Y, or Z, if we choose not to do this, it's not as if we're choosing not to pay for it. So okay. that's a distinction I would give, that this is something we can choose to tackle proactively we'll and humanely or not. We'll continue our conversation on Measure H, Los Angeles County's proposed quarter cent sales tax increase to fund homeless services. Requires two-thirds passage. It's on next Tuesday's LA County ballot. We'll continue with our guests right after this live update. <laughs> Rebecca, you wanted to say something, is that right? He said it. Oh, okay, great, all right. <laughs> Didn't want to overlook you, okay. All set? All right. From the Crawford Family Forum at KPECC, this is an Air Talk in-person voter game plan special. I'm Larry Natzel. Great to have you with us as we talk about Measure H on the Los Angeles County ballot, a proposed quarter cent sales tax increase to fund homeless services. By the way, find out more information about all the different items that are on the Los Angeles County ballot. You can visit kpcc.org slash voter game plan or follow us on Twitter using the hashtag voter game plan to get information about all the different measures. Uh, our panelists who are joining us to talk about Measure H are Veronica Lewis of the group Hopix in South Los Angeles, which provides services to the homeless population there, Rebecca Prine of Northeast LA-based Recycled Resources for the Homeless, Chris Coe of the United Way of Greater Los Angeles, uh, Jack Humphreyville, columnist for City Watch, and our own Rena Palta, KPCC's correspondent covering the social safety net. And uh, we're talking about some of the challenges with providing homeless services. Uh, Chris, let me go back to you. Just are there, are there programs that United Way has identified or the county knows of that are like just ready for, you're seeing the fruits, but there just simply isn't enough money to really get the critical mass you need? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I think the first and most potent thing that H provides that we're really excited to scale our street outreach teams, which would provide immediate relief for our communities and our homeless neighbors. Um, we've seen that throughout time uh, prove effective, but most recently over the last year, having C3 teams, which are city, community, um, and county teams with medical practitioners bringing medicine to the streets, um, that going out after our homeless neighbors to urge them to come inside and treat them on the streets. In terms of why it's so potent and, and putting at scale, I'll give you um, just a, a numbers example. So people who go to New York or Times Square ask, what did they do? What happened there that, that we might be able to do here? New York and the island of Manhattan and the surrounding boroughs have been spending about $20 million a year on outreach services. And up until this year, we have been spending maybe a few million dollars. And so the difference between and that $20 million, was, it's, that's the side of, uh, size of our 110 freeway with about a mile on each side. So they were spending quadruple, you know, um, 
quintuple the amounts of street outreach funding we're working on. It's a matter of uh, relationship and trust building, and so those street outreach efforts that we were funding to begin and test through the coordinated entry system, we've seen enough results to know that more of these teams being more out there will provide immediate relief for the encampments we see in our communities and our homeless neighbors who uh, feel forgotten on the streets. And how, uh, what's the best mix of staff versus volunteers? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got um, Rebecca's organization, which is all volunteer, and she did a great job of describing what the challenge is and the limitations in, in the hours you're available to help your population. Um, but volunteers are, are a really important part of this. How do you find the best mix? Oh my gosh, volunteers are it's absolutely critical because um, homelessness, at the end of the day, it's an expression of social isolation. Um, and I think what we can do as a community to welcome our homeless neighbors inside, I truly believe as we work to end homelessness, our homeless neighbors will teach us all what it means to be neighbors again. Um, and I think that is something a volunteer can do as well or even better uh, than a professional social worker. But what unlocks the ability for the volunteer to do their work are clinical paid staff who can provide some of the clinical supports that our homeless neighbors also need uh, so that the volunteer can provide their additional piece to them. So what Measure H does, before it, I think we always had to pick and choose between is it this program that we want or that program that we want because we know we can't do it all. Um, but I think our homeless neighbors de deserve our full effort and that is a mix of the street outreach teams who have clinical components supplemented by our volunteers. So we created a companionship program that after someone is inside and has other clinical supports, they can provide that, uh, that true kind of reintegration into okay. their communities and that um, just sense of being neighbors again, which I believe our volunteers can uniquely provide. Veronica Lewis of, of Hopix, um, what, are, what are things you have ready to go that if you had more money available be your highest priority to provide? Oh, <coughs> so, <laughs> um, we do a variety of things. So, you know, I think number one, to echo what Chris said, the ability to have field-based engagement, to meet people where they are, to get out of this whole concept of people having to come through your door between nine to five um, and kind of follow this traditional protocol being able to go out to where they are is one of the biggest priorities because some people won't go to shelter, we know that. And so we still have to have the capacity to engage them, provide the support, and literally move them from the street into permanent housing, which we've seen success with, but on a small scale because we don't have resources. I think the second thing would be, um, you know, the rental subsidies, the, the time-limited rental subsidies because at the end of the day, one of the contributing factors to homelessness is <coughs> income or ability to pay um, for where you live. And so the ability to help stabilize someone, pay rental assistance for a determined period of time, help them increase their income in the most appropriate manner, and then still wrap around services to help them sustain, reintegrate into the community, reestablish family connections, or whatever it's gonna take to remove the barriers from them being <coughs> stably housed long-term. I think that's the most important thing, the rental subsidies. Well, and how do you, how do you get to that point? I mean, as, as we've been talking about throughout this program, we've seen rents skyrocket all over LA, including the community you serve of South Los Angeles. Gentrification is coming to South LA. So even if you provide up to two years of, of bridge assistance to someone, how in the long term, unless they're able to raise their income enough, how, how are they gonna be able to stay in the community and stay housed? Right, so when I talk about the coordinated entry system and the efforts to work together, that's one of the key um, benefits of that because you're right. We have rents at $1,900 in communities that you know people still may not wanna live in and you still may have to be worried about your safety. And so we're doing innovative things. We have a really intensive, and that would be probably my third thing, landlord engagement effort as it relates to this. And it's you know on behalf of the entire region and so we're working with business owners, we're working with landlords, we're working with property owners, we're looking at shared housing or traditional roommate living opportunities. And so in the last, you know, since December 2015, both individuals and families, we've housed almost 500. I mean, so it's doable. And I'm not gonna say it's easy, but working together, having more boots on the ground to try to find these landlords 
who will work with us and or just figure out other creative options um, is what we need. We need more bodies, we need more resources to be creative. Uh, Rena Paulson, KPCC reporter, whenever we talk about services for the homeless population, one of the things I hear from listeners is, well, if you start providing more services, how do you keep more people from coming to Southern California <laughs> to get those services? It's a great place to live. And if you can get services on top of it and have people help you find housing, why not come? You know, what, what's the response to that argument that this makes LA a magnet? Sure. I mean, I have met folks who have just appeared on Skid Row from out of town, you know, coming to Los Angeles for reasons that a lot of people move to Los Angeles because uh, they're trying to start over, you know, find a better life for themselves. And then they do encounter more resources than they might in a place like Riverside or San Bernardino or, you know, Texas. Um, but I think the response to that is that the Los Angeles obviously has a massive poverty issue. Um, this is a, becoming more and more a city. It's just documented of people who have a lot of money and people who have very little. Um, so certainly uh, we've got a problem on our own. Um, there's, there's no escaping that. So it's kind of how do you, how do you solve the problem that's here? Uh, you can't put up a wall. You can't stop people from coming. We have free movement within the country. So. Um, that's just gonna, if it's a byproduct, you just have to deal with it, I guess. Um, Chris Coe, your, your thoughts on, on that, because um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a magnet anyway. That's right, and you, and you stole my words, Larry, I was gonna say, I can reassure all the listeners that if we pass Measure H, we will not have to build a wall around our county. Um, and we've seen that through our work. The, one of the things we've done to test and pilot whether this works or not is focus uh, very, very, um, tightly on the veteran population, which is a cross-section of most folks and our veteran homelessness population had been the number one population in America. And when we invested at scale, and the word certainly got around about that, we've seen it go down by 60% over the last five years. So it has not gone up. We have not attracted um, adversely more people. We have seen it go down overall. And I can also say, you know, when we looked into it, because we were also wondering about that, 70 to 90% of our homeless neighbors are homeless where they used to live prior to becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually one of the things that are difficult and part of why we need things like this because our homeless neighbors actually do not want to leave the neighborhoods um, that they were from. It's heartbreaking, but people stay in the San Gabriel Valley because that's where they grew up. They stay in the Antelope Valley because that's where well, they're from. Well, how do, you, how do you respond to people who say, well, you know, I can't afford to live in the neighborhood that I grew sure. up in Los Angeles. I had to, you know, move out to where housing is less, and I do a long commute because I can't afford to live in closer where I grew up. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's true, and I think we and our service provider friends do their best to negotiate affordability and the reality of things uh, with that desire to stay in their community. So at the end of the day, if uh, we're not able to afford it with that rental payment, they need to look at other communities, but still within LA, but all to say that LA is their home community for most of our homeless neighbors, um, and that's where they're from. They are Angelinos just like you and me. Uh, let me go back to Jack Humphreyville to ask about, you know, if this passes, it gets the two-thirds vote approval, what, what do you think is the likely scenario, and, and would you see at least that there will be advances on dealing with homelessness? Well, I, I should hope so. Um, you know, a couple of things that I, uh, I've observed just listening. One of the things I like is having sort of these people to my right providing the services as opposed to the county itself. You know, I think, you know, they're a little bit more invested in it. They're a little closer to it. Uh, you know, we, it, 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 it's just it seems like a much more efficient way to do it. One of the items that I, I Veronica, you mentioned the housing. Um, the city of Los Angeles, when they passed uh, HHH, we're talking about a, a cost per unit of $400,000. I mean, that's a potload of money. On the one, you know, I think we could probably be much more efficient by, as opposed to, you know, pounding nails, build modular housing. And modular housing would probably cost, let's say, as opposed to 400,000, might cost $100,000. I mean, literally those are the kind of numbers that I've seen at least. So, you know, you're talking $300,000, that's a potload of money every year if you look at it on an annual basis probably a thousand dollars fifteen hundred dollars a month so i would ho i would hope that they you know th what the people here are saying is true and that they can deliver the services uh, if the thing passes 
All right. I, I want to ask before we close about the the housing first model versus the supportive services. Uh, Rena, you're so immersed in this. Can you describe the sort of um, maybe they're not directly competing, but at least in terms of you know which model is the better one? We, is there a consensus? You know, for a long time, there was not a consensus uh, amongst county leaders about what was the best model. Do you put people directly into housing first and then wrap services around them? Or do you make people go through a process by which they kind of clean up their act before they're put into housing so that once they get into housing, they're able to keep it and they're stable? Um, for a long time, I would say actually nothing got done in the county to a large degree because there was so much debate over which strategy do we pick. Um, the County Board of Supervisors now are pretty much all on board with the Housing First model. That means, you know, get people into housing as fast as possible and then wrap the services around to keep them there. Um, that's sort of what we've heard from the Department of Housing and Urban Development as well as something they support as uh, as something that's been proven by data. Um, so that's kind of where, that's the direction in general that uh, the homelessness world is going. So many of our uh, larger providers are faith-based organizations, uh, either coalitions of religious groups or, or a particular um, uh, theological foundation for it. Are they going to be eligible for the money that comes to her because of the religious nature? Does that disqualify them for funding? You know, some faith-based groups do receive funding through the government right now. Um, they're also... The Board of Supervisors has uh, outlined a, a sort of advisory board, an advisory panel of quite a few people um, who will be basically giving them a, a, a blueprint for how to spend the H money should measure H pass, and faith leaders are included in that advisory panel. So I think there will be an effort to um, take advantage of some of the advances they've made. Um, that said, some some groups are kind of on board with Housing First, and some groups are not on board with Housing First. And so it'll kind of depend how they want to, if they're willing to pursue that strategy. Okay, Jack Humphrey. Yeah, one of the, one of the things I we're all concerned about is whether the county and the city can play you know, play together and whether they can play well. One of, you know, one, and one of my concerns there is that I think one of the, uh, one of the people, the person that was probably most responsible for getting this homeless uh, situation, both at the city and county, was Miguel Santana. Miguel Santana was the city administrative officer. He had previously worked at the county. So he had, he had a trust. Both of both cultures. He, he, he knew both of these organizations exceptionally well. And now he's moved on to Pomona, out to the fairgrounds. I just hope that you know every you know everybody will continue to play well. But we really do you know in terms of the city and the county working together and developing the Triple H and the H plans. Miguel Santana really deserves a, a real pat on the back. Yeah, Chris, go real quick comment. Yeah, I just uh, now that we're invoking the name of Miguel Santana, I just wanted to say <laughs> we are very proud to have him back on our business leaders task force. He was one of our independent experts we had analyze the county budget um, to see whether we needed this, and he is absolutely committed in this fight. Yeah, a uh, quick comment, uh, Veronica. Lewis. I'll make it really quick. In addition to being a service provider, I'm a part of leadership in the countywide and in my community in particular, sitting at policy tables and things like that. And so I can say with certainty in terms of input being provided by the experts, the city and the county working collaboratively, it's happening, because I'm at, I'm at those tables as You're well. You're seeing it, okay. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you all so much for being with us. That was Veronica Lewis of Hopix, uh, which serves South Los Angeles with homeless services, Rebecca Prine of, of Recycled Resources for the Homeless in Northeast LA, Chris Coe directs homeless initiatives for United Way of Greater LA, Jack Humphreyville, columnist for City Watch, and our own Rena Palta, who you always hear covering <laughs> Southern California's <laughs> social safety net. We remind you more information available by visiting KPECC's voter game plan page at kpecc.org. Follow us on Twitter with the hashtag voter game plan. Have a terrific afternoon. Fresh Air with Terry Gross comes up next. Back with you tomorrow morning at 11 right here on KPECC. <laughs> right, so we're going to close now with questions from our audience. And uh, let me uh, read your names if you come right here, line up with Claire right over here, uh, Gretchen from South Pasadena, and Robert from Eagle Rock. 
And I've got a Twitter question. Terrific. All right. So Gretchen and Robert. Uh, yeah. oh, hold on just a moment, Gretchen. We need to get your microphone on. And uh, test. There we go. All right. There we go. Uh, my question, I guess, relates to triage, um, how it's working now, and how um, it will work going forward. Hopefully, age passes. Um, how is how are different groups types of groups of people prioritized like what we've seen is uh, veterans being a top priority I mean we have teenagers we have young families we have these different groups of people that how how are we going to decide what who most critically needs these things first and I'm particularly wondering about the undocumented. Mm. Can I? Uh, want, uh, you want to take that on, Rebecca? Sure. So one, one good thing about the development of mm -hmm. the CES survey, um, the coordinated entry survey, is it allows us to prioritize people by their level, level of vulnerability. So it used to be that the higher functioning folks would come in and seek housing. They were the ones who could navigate the resources. They were the ones who would meet with the case manager, so they were the easiest on the caseload, and they would in turn get the housing first. I think now what the county has realized is that we need to start prioritizing the people who are the sickest, so who have the, the most challenges set before them, either physical, mental, substance use, age, undocumented, all of these things that they have going on, and prioritize them for services first, and that's what in theory, what our CES housing system should do, what we're seeing the lack of, obviously, is the affordable housing to house all of these people that we have in the system, and then the, the lack of funding to follow up the services to get them housed and keep them housed. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that both HHH and H will do this. And are there any barriers in the funding that has to do with the immigration status of, of people who are getting services, or is, is that not even asked by the providers. Yeah, so I think that question actually proves the point why Measure H needs to pass, because that's the constant struggle that we have now because there's just not enough money. I think that um, the, the beauty of the county system as opposed to the federal dollars that come in is that we are serving all populations, including those who may not have legal residence in our county, but that very point is the reason why we need the 355 million, because it is a challenge prioritizing Tay or transitional age youth, I'm sorry, versus families with children versus individuals. And this um, public investment will give us an opportunity to serve everybody. Veronica, how do you prioritize at, at your service provider? So we, you know, we actually are serving all the populations, um, but, you know, and each funding stream has, tells us who we can serve and what we need to do, but obviously, um, those who are highly vulnerable, we try to get them off the street as fast as possible, as quick as possible, but um, you know, it really just is a matter of trying to do the best with what we have, honestly. And some of your funding you're saying is designated right, for Right, some is designated populations. for lower acuity folks, some is designated for you know, youth, some are designated for families, and even within those, there's you know, lots of caveats to what you can and can't do. Um, and so we honestly just do the best we can. I mean, we have an over, let me just be clear, we have more people coming to, through our doors than we have resources to serve. Yeah, we'd be shocked if so, it was otherwise. Right, but there's not a perfect map as yeah. to how we prioritize. What, uh, what's your, what's your um, professional staffing versus volunteers at, at the organization? Um, we probably have about 5% volunteers because free labor is not free, I always say. Somebody has to manage and coordinate yeah, volunteers, sure. so that yeah. would be great if we could build to that. But yeah, 95, and I have you know a staff of 80, um, you got a big organization well, at Hoppix. Mm -hmm. And Larry, I think the question of yeah. prioritization, I just want to remind us that triage is necessitated by scarcity. And so what I am so excited about with Measure H is that we will be able to stop picking and choosing at the levels we've been forced to for years. And so to now, we have to play whack-a-mole because with $50 million a year or 100, you have to choose between youth versus uh, single adults versus veterans versus chronic right. homelessness when we know that all of our homeless neighbors need support and help So I think that's where we're excited that there are triaging systems in use and that's part of the evidence-based system We did put in place, 
But even with that, we know everyone can make it if they're given the right resource. That's part of the, the principle behind the triaging system we use. Um, so to be able to actually provide that to, to the, the full spectrum is something we're all excited about. All right, yes sir, your first name, the community you're from. Okay, uh, Robert, I'm uh, from Eagle Rock. And my question here is, um, with the amount of money that the, uh, that the Measure H would produce, or Proposition H, um, what assurance do we have that it's going to actually reach down to the people who are homeless? Because you have money here, and I'm looking at this as a, probably something that uh, people would pounce on as a ripe source for funding. You have private sector versus um, uh, nonprofit and so on that may look to produce a work or a product that is more important to them or more, more the function of uh, perpetuating their, their business than it is to provide actual quantifiable results to the homeless. Well, that, that would seem to relate to the oversight issue and, and who's actually choosing uh, the recipients. Which one of you wants to speak to that issue? Uh, I'll start off quickly, and I'll, I'll just say that that's, again, part of why we created the service delivery system, because we did see, I think your point is a good one, we did live in a system that was contract-centric or program-centric versus being person-centric. So now what happens is that regardless of where you are, if you come in through this no-wrong-door system, it highlights who needs what, and regardless of if you're in an area without a homeless provider network, and that's part of you know even Rebecca's story. She's in an area that hadn't had physical buildings built up, but their clients through this system and this no-wrong-door, which we call a match.com for housing and services, um, they're able to now access up to this giant you know, ladder to county resources. So you put it in, uh, but the person on the other end, is their need is, is very clearly identified. And it was such a shift that we had to actually, we are in the middle right now of overhauling our entire database system to accommodate, accommodate that client-centric approach. Right, thank you. Uh, Andrea on Twitter, uh, at AirTalk asks, how much is uh, the city spending out of its current budget to address homelessness? Um, and she's probably curious about the county too since this is a county measure. Do any of you know what those numbers are currently? This, Jack? The, the city uh, this last year put in 140, had a $140 million budget. I think like 50 of that was donated in land. Uh, 26 came from special funds. I think 20 was supposed to come from a linkage fee. And I think they might have had like 40, 50 million dollars out of the general fund. The county, on the other hand, I've, I've seen numbers like 450, 500 million dollars, but those have sort of been scattered and not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of certainty in those numbers, in large part because I think the county doesn't know what the hell they're doing. Well, <laughs> and do we know how much that's increased or, or not in recent years? If you have a sense of that? Well, the, the city basically, this $140 million that they're talking about is pretty much new money. Um, you know, ab again, a bunch of it was going to be contributed to land for, you know, the, I think those were those yeah. t uh, 12 parcels, if you will. So that was a big initiative. I think the problem the city's going to have is this upcoming year, Eric, well, he mentioned on your program yesterday that, you know, there's a $250 million deficit. Uh, for the city, projected for the city next year, and they're already probably 245 short this year. Uh, you know, are they going to be able? You know, does that include the homeless thing? I don't think it does. So, you know, the city going to be hard hard pressed to come up with this uh, new dough. Uh, yeah. I, I I don't see how they're going to do it. Chris, I think that yeah. I, I think that's actually just a perfect fitting example of why it's so important to lock in with dedicated revenue sources. Because one year you you think you'll have a lot of money. Um, and then even with the political will to put it on the budget in that fashion. And the next year, you never know whether it's the economy or a change in the um, elected officials on that board. So I think that's just a, a telling example of year by year, you know, how political um, priorities can change, but for measures like H that lock in a clear priority with the dedicated funding source. All right, I want to thank you all so much for being with us, providing both your expertise, your experience on the ground, and providing homeless services, uh, Rena's ongoing coverage of this and other issues on the social safety net. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Measure H, next Tuesday's city, our LA County ballot.
quarter cent sales tax increase for homeless services. Thanks for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, you have a chance to vote next Tuesday if you haven't already voted by mail. Thanks a lot. Have a great evening.